Hello everyone, Loremaster of Sotek here with easily the most special episode of Lorebeards that we have had and probably ever will have. So uh, we somehow got permission to uh, get to sit down and have a chat with the one and only Andy Hall, the uh, lead man behind all of the amazing uh, lore and stories that we've seen cropping up for Total Warhammer and kind of tying an impossible amount of different editions and lore together into one cohesive game, which is an impossible task, and yet he's somehow been managing it all these years. And we're kind of going into the magnum opus of Total War Warhammer 3, but we have the opportunity here to sit down with him and talk a lot about Cathay, and that's what we're going to be doing today. So uh, we're not going to waste any time. Uh, Nathan, do you just want to just take us in? Uh, it's, it's kind of weird doing this uh, not live, you know? <laughs> but... <laughs> Don't break the illusion. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh... Actually. Yeah, um, go ahead. I, I, think, I think it's probably important to give you some your viewers maybe a bit of context of why we're doing it this way, why I'm talking to you guys. Um, and, and that's because, obviously, every Warhammer race up until this point, um, well, less than the Vampire Code, has had uh, an army book and and you guys as consumers and viewers have been able to pour over those army books um uh, and and kind of get in your heads what may or not may not come and speculate uh, uh, etc um but obviously cafe is a bit of a special case um so we've done a couple of digestible articles uh for for people on the blogs you know uh people that probably aren't following it as close uh as, as as some other people want to or if i was a, a player i would want to and i think what we're going to do today is uh, we have an opportunity to really get into the weeds uh, of the law you know the law's been written by games workshop um i have the army book before me here um it, it mainly in my head uh but there will be times when i'll be having to having to look through the pages um and, and this will be an opportunity to do a real kind of deep dive for players who you know who want to spend hour two hours with us and just talk kind of law non-stop uh so I, I think it's important to kind of explain why why we're doing this uh and that that's kind of why if, if that makes sense yeah that's great and uh an excellent kind of set down there but that does kind of lead into easily the most important question we have which is how much do we have to pay you Give us that book. <laughs> like Sotek and I have a spare kidney each, right? Uh, yeah. No, <laughs> uh, there is no price. Um, I like uh, being able to pay pay the mortgage to my house. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, I, I'm at home, by the way. And obviously, not the studio. This is where I've been working for the past uh, year. I, I I have recently started going back into the studio actually, oh, cool. uh, and so that's been good. To, to start, uh, you know, seeing friends on the computer screen. That's, and oh, that's good. That, that's, yeah, be, that's being, that being is, trapped here at home is a... <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> well, hopefully, yeah. maybe Games Workshop will go crazy and sell that as a PDF or something. I would buy that so fast. <laughs> I would <laughs> so, pay so lots fast. of money. <laughs> like, the tabletop guy in me really wants to see those rules. Obviously, we'll see a translation of it eventually when the army gets released. But, like... Uh, like you know, Sotek and I, we started what fifth edition? You started? Yeah, yeah. So just yeah, just another army in eighth is like oh, it make me feel old. It's amazing. <laughs> Second edition. Um, I don't. I don't think. I don't think we were alive yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's an important point. You know, uh, when we talked to Games Workshop about doing this, they they they've literally wrote as a really cool army book that there is rules in here. And how to play these, how to play with this force in eighth edition, uh, and that's really important actually, um, because that's how we've been designing the factions. We've been taking the eighth edition army books, and the key is on the eighth edition, and and bringing that and converting that, and that's kind of been my job along with the designers like uh, Jim Whitston and uh, uh, Ian, uh, our game director, and and Rich Aldridge who runs the DLC team. All these guys have been working with since 2014. And and taking that army book and and turning it into a total war kind of force faction camp campaign side and battle side, 
Uh, and so that's kind of what we've been able to do here with, with, with Cafe. That's incredible. Awesome. All right, are uh, we ready to get into some lore? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> do it. Let's do it. Uh, Nathan, why don't you why don't you take us in with a first question? Yeah, actually, this kind of links up to what you've said. Is the Total War series uh, mostly follows Eighth Edition in terms of timeline for Warhammer Fantasy Battles, dabbling in some older editions, and obviously. Uh, we've seen some creative input from yourselves, such as Rapance and so on, bringing her forward in the timeline. Uh, would it be safe to assume then that uh, Kefayan lore that we'll see will be the stuff that we see from older editions and obviously Old World 2? Because it looks like there, because sometimes obviously you do have a bit of a mix. Yeah, yeah. Um... I, for a start, I, I can't talk about uh, Games Workshop plans for, for the yeah. old world. Uh, I, I, I don't, a, I don't know, and B, I, I, I probably wouldn't be uh, <laughs> able to. Yeah. Uh, I will leave that firmly with the guys in Nottingham. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, um, yeah, this is um, a, a definitely kind of 8th edition. Um, the, the actual dates, we're, we're definitely going to keep close to our chest for now. For reasons um may become apparent later on mm. um but I, I think what's more interesting uh when we started talking with workshop about this is um we wanted to get cafe up to the eighth edition standard pretty fast straight mm. out of the gate i mentioned this in the one of the earlier blogs it is that obviously the empire for instance has been constantly evolving um and iterating on for for you know 20 25 years uh, and one of the goals was, was to get Cafe, you know, not just its first army book, but to in our heads, or they've already had all those iterations and, and bring it up to that 8th edition standard, because that's what Warhammer, Total War Warhammer is based on, its 8th edition Warhammer, um, yeah. from the get-go. Um, yeah, I, I think we've been reasonably successful. Um, so, yeah, think about the, the timeline is, is certainly in that that period, Carl Franz is alive. Um, yeah, in so in that twenty five hundred plus period, but I, I, I'm not going to be nailed exactly what year that is. I, I don't think it matters to be honest. Yeah, no, it's just more because uh, obviously there were bits of lore throughout almost every single edition, and uh, to see it now being shaped. Obviously, we've seen that first trailer. And uh, it is more or less what fans, especially old school Warhammer Fantasy fans, expected in terms of visually and so on. But like uh, to see it bring, like brought to life, is kind of like wow. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, I would say if I was, you know, the other side of the fence, if I wasn't lucky enough to be working at Games Workshop, my, my head would be going ah! at the moment. Um, yeah. Um. I think in a roundabout way, you're asking if, if like the the existing law previously that kind of mentioned cafe is is that still relevant? Is it being overwritten? Um, well, a Games Workshop does that all the time. Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. And you know the the latest army book or codex is is what's meant to have you know is is always a, a, a canon rewrite. Not. Not always, actually. Sometimes yeah. they acknowledge previous things. Um, and I think, um, actually, there's a bit here I, I, I might mention that uh, I think uh, Owen, Bar Owen Brannan, who, uh, no, um, Owen, uh, one of the writers of the book, mm -hmm. um, uh, so mentions, um, so uh, he, he was talking about, so earlier texts refer, this is talking about like the Celestial Dragon Emperor, so earlier texts refer to him as Enhyong, while later accounts adopt the name Emperor Wu uh, as East, but that is a miscommunication between the, the kind of the old world scholars um, not understanding or even having the concept of it's the same emperor, because uh, Emperor Wu is an Eastern term for a magical lord. So it, it called it, <laughs> called it. <laughs> yeah. So. So, kind of stuff has already be, is being addressed. It's yeah. as it, we're not just saying, you know, uh, Emperor the Emperor Wu doesn't exist. It's just that the Eastern scholars 
didn't quite get it right. Uh, which, you know, there's plenty of historical precedents where that yeah. sort of yeah. happens all yeah. the bloody time or did happen. Um, it's frequently used by transfer state. Oh, well, there's difficulty in remembering the name of a creature who's effectively ruled the largest human empire in the world for at least 5,000 years, you see. Awesome. So, you know. All right, that's great. That kind of maybe. Right, thank you. That's, that's perfect. Yeah. That, that is exactly, uh, that's great. Um, so I got a question, which is, uh, so a character I'm really curious to hear more about, if you can tell us more about her, because she's been name dropped, but we're, we have, don't have a lot of specifics on her, is the Moon Empress. It, it seems mm. implied that she also is a dragon that is kind of on par with the Celestial Dragon Emperor, but being called the Moon Empress, does she have any connection with Manslib, the, the true moon, the one that's always been there? As one of these primordial ancients, or what, what is it? What is it that her title specifically refers to? So she's Queen Yang, the the Moon Dragon, Empress of the Grand Cafe, Mistress of the Ancestral Realms, Commander of the Imperial Agents, and Master of the Moon Winds. Um, so she's very much Yin, where the Celestial Dragon and Zen Yang, that's his name, is is, is Yang. Yang magic, but the Moon Empress represents Yin magic, so it's almost like day and night. Um, so she she kind of controls the agents of the world. Uh, you know, all the ambassadors of of Cafe will answer to her. She has her own spy networks. Um, she very much works in the shadows, in the darkness. But don't mistake that for her being evil um she's certainly not um and and yeah they they are her and her husband the the dragon emperor uh, are kind of older older than the cafe itself as well and i think i've seen a couple of kind of people referring to well how actually old is cafe and it's like well we don't know the exact age we just know that those two were walking around that area of of, of what the warhammer world for a long time before before, you know, even there was an, an official empire, is they were kind of ruling the tribes and, uh, and stuff. And uh, at some point, you know, that they got to the point where they became known as the emperor and empress uh, and almost form formalized cafe. But they, they've been around, as we've kind of said in the past, you know, before, before the old ones. Um, and especially around that area, they, they've laid claim to it long, long before. Awesome. Uh, Great. That's yeah. wonderful. Uh, that is perfect. Awesome. Uh, Nathan. Cool. Um, so I, I think it's worth probably mentioning, you know, um, uh, about about the Jagan children, because that is obviously a big part of... Uh, that is another of, question we had. Yep. <laughs> We'd love to know more about them. I, I, I'm sure you would. I'm sure you would. Well, I, I mean, there's nine Dragon children. Oh, okay, um, so there's okay, okay. nine specifically. Nine. Yes, there is very specifically nine dragon children. Now, four of them have been, as I like to term it, have been lost to time and and and, and antipathy as well. Um, so, so we don't know what's happened to four of them. Um, but there are five active who are effectively ruling cafe. So you know about two. Yeah. Talked about those, and then we have uh, the Jade Emperor, um, not the sorry Jade Dragon, mm -hmm. who uh, basically rules uh, Central Cafe, uh, and he's very much uh, uh, an administrator. He, he's trusted by all the Dragon Children, um, and he kind of you know makes sure all the edicts from the, the Dragon Emperor himself go out. Um, and he, he kind of keeps everyone in in, in order. He, um, uh, so the other dragon children kind of think of he's a bit boring, but reliable. Yeah. Um, and then going south, we have uh, the fire dragon, um, and he 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 looks after that that border between between Ind and and Kuresh. Um, uh, he's very fiery tempered, you know. Fire is the thing. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and he's a, he's a bit miffed that uh, uh, Ying kind of gets all the glory uh, of defending the, the Great Bastion, where he's like, I've got it's a, he's got a really hard job mm. defending the Sun and Bull. Oh, I'm sure he does. Um, because well, the ma- there's the mountains of heaven, uh, it, in the south as well, and that's where that's where the um, someone else lives. Uh, the moment. someone else, uh, yeah, someone, someone we may that. speak about later. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, uh, to, to, to the east is Yin Yin, who is the sea dragon, so mm-hmm. she's the ruler of the eastern prince, uh, the eastern provinces. And she rules uh, and is admiral of the Grand Dragon Fleet, uh, who go into the Jade Sea. And she's kind of, she's really interesting, actually, because she's the one, it's, she's kind of expansionist. Uh, she's the one, she, she had tried a, um, an invasion of the Southlands that failed. Ah, got ah, very ah, ah, Nice. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm glad we're Arthur. keeping that story um yeah yeah absolutely um so yeah so so um i i kind of like her i want to see more of her whether so, we will or not so confirmed. we've got <laughs> we've got black in the north silver or white to the west red to the south jade in the center and do we know what color the east dragon is um i think she's she's more blue actually blue yeah. or azure yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I got my last little thing about the dragons. Uh, the the dragon children specifically. Um, can you tell? So I, I assume they all can turn into humans. Uh, yeah. At, um, yeah. Uh, so my last two things, uh, questions about them are: a, do we when they are human, is it like everybody instantly knows who they are? Like, you know, we've noticed that Zhao Ming and uh, Mia, uh. Yao Ying have the whited out eyes, and it seems like they stick out pretty obviously when they're in human form. Um, can they stealth among the people of Cathay, or does everyone just kind of instantly know that one of the dragons is around? I I think um, certainly you can tell, and uh, I don't think they're trying to hide that fact. You know, that they are the rulers of these provinces, so I I think they you they go into human form almost to be able to communicate and converse and and you know move around the people and and, and sit in the palaces actually sit in the palaces uh, and, and um you know order their subjects um but they are all capable shapeshifters so if they wanted to you know go into into the general populace as a like a beggar woman or or whatever you I, i'm sure they could you know, oh, okay. kind of like Michael Jackson used to so, do. So, so, <laughs> he used to go incognito, didn't you? So they're not and... they're not strictly limited to like a single human form. They can actually change it. Um, I, I don't think I, I I don't think they can go. Oh, I'm going to change into that table, or you know, we'll change. Okay, into so like stack. minor minor edits to a human form. I I would imagine so. Um, I, I, I think their, their standard kind of human form is what they spend a lot of their time in. But, you know, if, if they wanted to use a bit of their magic, and don't forget, these are all highly capable beings. Yeah. Uh, they, could, they could definitely do that, especially, especially the ones favoured by um, the Moon Empress, who that's kind of a whole deal. Uh, she, she certainly goes around the Empire in disguise talking to people. Oh, great. Um, and cool. then my, my last question regarding the kiddos is, uh, at least for uh, now, is do we know vaguely how old they are? Are we dealing with, like, they've been around for centuries or they've been around for, like, thousands of years? Do we have a ballpark of what their ages are? Thousands. Obviously, they're not as old as, obviously, they're not as old as the emperor and empress. But they, they, they've certainly been about for thousands of years. Certainly beyond the ken of any kind of modern humans they'll have always known that these people are people these beings have ruled them okay so they uh, they predate Cathay as well uh i think i'm i'm not sure they predate it uh um i think they're certainly 
probably weren't about when the old ones were, were still knocking around, but they're, they're probably certainly older uh, than, you know, some of the oldest kind of... Awesome. Um, so they're kind of there with, like, the Star Dragons of the High Elves, age-wise. Yeah, def definitely. And, you know, they, these are ancient, powerful beings, even the children. Awesome. Awesome, that's good to know. All right. Nathan, what you got? Uh, I want to go back to uh, something that you mentioned, obviously, uh, as the, uh, the, the Eastern Dragon is uh, an expansionist. Now, uh, older Kefian law kind of suggested them to be fairly isolationist. Uh, this is obviously being, like, we know that Cafe is being rewritten and so on. So is it safe to say that Cafe as a empire has possibly expanded like other human nations have done into separate locations like for example we've got new world colonies and so on we have to keep in mind that obviously they are still human and humans love to explore they are but uh, they have you know it, they are still in general an isolationist nation you know right. um but that nation itself is, is big you know it's yeah it's massive mm -hmm. yeah. And it contains many peoples and cultures within itself. And the, the emperor has has not really had any need or or a desire um, to expand, you know, west or, or something. In fact, he, he, you know, he put the great moor in there to punish the, the ogres and stuff. He, you know, he created that desolate wasteland and he, he, he didn't want to go for that. That, I mean, there are outliers, uh, like we, we just mentioned, um, yeah. Yin, who, who feels that they should be. Um, but the, the book kind of, they talk about the fact that, you know, with times are starting to change in the 2500 era. Yeah. And, and what has been gone before, um, you know, with the crowning of an ever chosen means the status quo is starting to change and yeah. and maybe the emperor is feeling that there is a need to expand maybe even expand north cool um, awesome yeah that's great um a question i had about the dragons i i've gotten this question a lot from people and i'm curious about it as well so <clears throat> obviously most of the old world older lore is written very specifically from the perspective of the west um, and one of the things we have is we do have, you know, quite a bit of lore on dragons, but, um, one thing that people ask is, do the, are the Cathayan dragons kind of their own dramatically different species? For instance, the lore in like sixth edition and in the storm of magic and eighth edition says that like how Galanos the black is the father of all dragons. Like he's big daddy of all dragons. Is he the celestial dragon emperor and the moon empress's dad? Uh, or are they a complete offshoot, like a different species? I I think they're as old as the, them, but I, I, I don't think they, they come from the same sire. I, I think they are definitely a slight offshoot. You can see that in their physical appearance. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we're taking inspiration from in Eastern influences, the more serpentine, which suggests they're a a slightly different species and you you also got to put into the the warhammer you know self uh, effectuating uh, um, kind of you know boasting you know i'm the father of all dragons yeah yes of course you are. <laughs> yeah. um but i i think what makes the dragons very these dragons very different it's not necessarily a physical or their genesis it is their their attitude um and they look down upon the western dragons you know they can't believe they're being ridden they're like <laughs> let people ride you Ugh! you know they would never it's inconceivable to the, the dragons of cafe to be ridden you know that's that to them Definitely. that's almost like the greatest insult and i think that interestingly it, you know that, that and this is actually this isn't in the book this has come from a discussion i had with andy hall mark bedford about this uh at gwhq that they they um uh, that would probably proliferate down into into the people of cafe so they'll they'll look at the high elves who are you know very haughty and you know look at us kind of thing and they go 
Uh, but you ride dragons. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Oh man, it's like eh, that's when 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 the when the dragons that hate the high elves are the ones that honestly are the most like them. <laughs> Warhammer in it. Yeah, yeah, that's good. perfect. Oh, I love that. Oh, you get these little intricacies. Yeah, that's great. So it, it would be pretty safe to say it sounds like that all the lore we've had about dragons should basically be like have a tab that says Western dragons as opposed to just dragons. Yeah, I think so. I think Western. Uh, yeah, we we're saying that from um for ease of reference. I I don't think there's a. A canonical distinction within the world from a if you were looking into that world, or right. part of that world. or like non uh, non Cathayan, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right yeah. exactly. You know, and uh, I don't think any other dragons other than the Cathayan dragons, certainly none we know about yet, can obviously transmute into in, into a right. a different mm -hmm. form like like these dragons can. Awesome, very exciting. Thank you. Okay. Talking about disdain, I I think it's a it's an interesting point. The the celestial dragon emperor has a very much similar disdain to the gods themselves. Uh, now, um, I mean, this may be a little bit of my own doing in one of the early plans. Uh, you know, let's clarify that uh, cafe and dragons aren't gods. They're not gods, mm. and they don't see themselves as gods, and don't even want to be seen as gods. They're revered, not worshipped. They're revered all the same. Um, but they, they have a disdain for gods um, because they're older than the gods in many cases. You know, if, if, if that kind of Warhammer law thing that gods exist through belief. You know, that cafe and dragons existed before, before there was kind of mortals to, to generate that belief and create the gods. Right. So they're not gods. And in many cases, they're not as powerful as gods. Certainly not as powerful as gods. Um, but... They don't hold much shift with gods at all, and therefore the Cafeans themselves don't. Oh, I love that. Shift. I love that. The difference is ancestor worship. They do worship their ancestors. Okay. And the, the villages of Cafe of, of, of kind of temples and shrines to their ancestors. So. Uh, hmm. Nathan, I think that could lead into a, one of the questions you had about you know. Uh, well, I've actually got uh, something to ask about the dragons themselves first, because uh, obviously we, we, we've talked about the, uh, the dragon emperor and his family and so on, but we're, we're talking about uh, Cafean dragons like if they're a separate uh, subspecies, in a sense. Is it safe to say that there are more Cafean dragons out there? I don't think so. I think, I think there's about... Not that we know of. Hmm. I think there's 11. I have yeah. nine I children, have, two two parents, uh, four of which are, are missing. So I have I have a potentially stupid question, but if it turned out to be true, I think it'd be cool. Is there any evidence to suggest that the so according to the Archaeon stories, the dragon he fought to get the Eye of Shirin is said to be a dragon from the east and it's shaped like a Cathayan dragon. It, I don't remember his actual name, but in the West they call him Flame Fang, which isn't his real name. He has like a Cathayan name. Is that perhaps a corrupted one of the children, or a Cathayan dragon that went bad? Oh, your mic cut out. <laughs> did it? Did it? I, I don't know. That's definitely a no comment from me. Okay. I, I'm not into that one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, slot that I under plausible. <laughs> I think it's plausible. I, I think there's very much a reason that you know Andy, Andy Hall, not. Um, sometimes me and Andy get confused together because I'm Andy Hall, H A W L, and he's Andy Hall, H O A R E. Um, I think there's very much a reason why there are unaccounted for cafe and dragons, uh, dragon children. I'm, I'm, counting, I'm, I'm slotting that under head cannon, not even plausible. That's going straight to head cannon. <laughs> that's fine, but that's not me. It's uh, that, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so another question, I, I don't know if you'll be able to, uh, answer this one yet because this, I, I almost feel like y'all are kind of building up to the details on this, but mm. in the conversations about the Celestial Dragon Emperor and the Moon Empress, uh, in one of the articles, we got a note that they vanished for about 400 years. Mm. Can you tell us anything about that? Like may, when in the timeline they vanished for 400 years? Was this like during the yeah. Great War? I mean, it's 
Time of Darkness and Disharmony. It's it's, it's kind of a, a very known um, part of cafe in history. I say known, obviously you guys don't know, but it, 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 it's there in the, the cafe in history. So it was about four to five hundred years ago, that, and they disappeared for a reason that they haven't really said. Um, and and in that time, yeah, the um, the Monkey King managed to take take over great parts of a cafe while um, uh, while the Dragon Children just basically started fighting each other. So um, was it they vanished five hundred years ago and only got back a century ago, or was it they got back five hundred years? Ago? So, in 1999, I can give you an exact date. Oh, awesome. Um, I love exact dates. <laughs> the, the Dragon Emperor and Empress mysteriously vanish, leaving Grand Cafe without its rulers. The period of Cafe's history becomes known as the Time of Darkness and Disharmony. And, and then in that intervening period, the Dragon Emperor's children bicker and fight amongst themselves, while the Monkey King uses the confusion to seize new territories, and Grand Cafe is divided like no time in its history. And then in uh, the Monkey King seizes power uh, and installs the warlord Kishik of Clan Eshin as his advisor. Begins to trade with the Skaven. Uh, and then that finally kicks the dragon children's asses into gear. Right, um, cool. how it's written. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, that's so exciting. Oh, my that's God. Good, that's good. Differences and and, and unite to oppose this upstart monkey emperor. Um, and then the celestial in 2380. There you go, an exact date, what well, an exact year. Uh, the celestial dragon and moon dragon return, casting the monkey king down from his throne. Ooh, that's really interesting. But why they went away for that period, um, who knows? Ah, um, I, I have some theories, but we'll. Yeah. I'll save that for another time. <laughs> I, I don't think you'll be able to answer those for me. So, I, I mean, what I do know, and it's something I'm not going to share with you guys today, uh, is, is that the, the the Celestial Dragon Emperor and the Empress, they they are working towards something. Yeah, they yeah. are. There is a plan in place. They're trying to do something. It, it, um, okay. Whether that's for the good of Cafe or they're who trying knows? To... I mean, dragons thinking, you know. They're immor- almost immortal beings. They they think in a different way to us. Mm. So hopefully, hopefully yeah. they learn from the mistakes of the old ones. <laughs> hopefully, or, or you know, they don't particularly like the old ones because the old ones buggered it up for them. Excuse the French. Understandably, <laughs> yeah, yeah. understandably, you know, they, they, their world was how they. That's why there was dragons on the world before anything else. It was a you know, it, the, the planet. Uh, was in their their effectively their Goldilocks zone, and it was the old ones that moved it closer, mm. and and then effectively put all dragons to sleep or made them sleepier. And it was only the most powerful dragons that were able to withstand that. Mm. Of course, Celestial Dragon uh, being one, and the Moon Empress. That's probably why he found the Moon Empress. Um, she was one of the few dragons that could withstand that planetary shift. Yeah, I one I think one of the things I love so much about the Cathay trailer was that kind of snippy line uh, Miao Ying opens with that seems to be very clearly referencing the old ones and how they you know if I mean if it weren't for the old ones chaos wouldn't be on the planet so <laughs> no and the dragons would be you know the dominant species cool oh. so. And again, the people she serve are there because of the old ones. So, does that does is she endeared to them? I don't know. They certainly serve and revere her. Um, but you know, she may even treat them like we treat treat mayflies or you know or goldfish or you know <laughs> pets. <laughs> like. It, it, it um, is interesting because the the blog has shown two different personalities so far from the uh, two legendary lords shown. Uh, sure. Everyone's really put Zhao as uh, they've effectively started calling him Dragon Bro. <laughs> yeah, can, can, is, is, oh, there, is there any truth behind 
behind that, a lot of people are seeming to equate uh, Zhao Ming with almost like an Uncle Iroh type character from Avatar, or a, a very, a, a much more mm-hmm. humble and personable dragon. He certainly puts I, I can't say I was inspired by Uncle Iroh because I've never seen Avatar. Mm. So, um, I, I, I think I've caught the occasional episode, but it's certainly not something I, I was inspired by. Mm. Um, but again, you know, one plays with these archetypes all the time. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's like I said in the blog, I, I think he will share japes um, and talk you know, talk to his to his subjects and, and mm. probably does beloved them a bit more than mm. than than Mei Ying does. Um and and so, you know, maybe there is a true affection there and, and yeah, and he will I say share a joke, have a drink with them. And, and so I think that's a fair assumption. Mm. Ah, that's super interesting. Um I mean, oh go ahead. I was about to say, like, I mean, personally, I, I hope that's the case because obviously uh, I, I've worked in a few uh, different jobs and obviously you, you tend to respect the leader more who's willing to come down to to have a drink with you and, you know, it, it's, it inspires loyalty, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does. Now, whether he's doing that consciously because uh, he thinks, he, you know, he's, his subjects will perform better, whether he's doing it to spite the other dragons, because um, they don't <laughs> like him. Mary Ying's cold and aloof. I don't know whether you know that. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we have read about that. Yeah. Um, you know, that's certainly within his bounds. Again, you, you're trying to portray some someone that's lived for thousands of years. Um, and so, actually, it's interesting that he does treat us as, as probably a, a benevolent boss would. Mm. Um, uh, so that in itself is interesting that this this creature it's lived for so long you know to, to him people it's like it'd be like you taking an interest like like staying a fly and you know oh, you're right little fly and stuff <laughs> well, that would be weird, wouldn't it? <laughs> so that's almost how the, the dragons think about it it's like why is he taking an interest um, now, I, I don't want this to tip the other way, because I, I think, it, you know, it makes it quite clear in the book and, and certainly the work we've done in Why Am I Free that dragons are largely benevolent, you know, mm. creatures. Uh, they, they do care about the empire of Cafe. They want it, they want it and its subjects to remain safe. Um, we wanted, when we were doing the makeup of the game, we, we wanted a hero race, you know, um, mm. not to um because people like to play the good guys um and so cafe is an order faction oh yeah I mean, you need some order to balance out all those demons <laughs> yeah. so, so many demons exactly now is is you know as with all warhammer is there a bit you know once you pickle pickle scab away is there some some slightly unsavory aspects there certainly mm. is and but you know those will come as as people play the game and and Read, read the law that's in there and you know and, and as and when uh games workshop comes and looks at cafe uh um we'll start to see that more and more but obviously mm. for a for a start you know we're, we're still two three weeks into introducing this faction we obviously want to give you almost like the tourist pamphlet of cafe mm. you know, and we're loving it. Nation in the world you know protectors of the east um but yeah that depth is certainly there in in cafe. Hmm. Well, it sounds really interesting. Yeah. Um. So we we kind of touched on them one. earlier. <laughs> uh, we kind of touched on them earlier. So I I think we might as well dive into them. Um, hmm. a character that's been kind of popping up more and more, and a lot of people are super excited to see that he's still part of the universe is the Monkey King. Um, is there? Uh, you mentioned that he seems to have either an alliance or some kind of positive relationship with Clan Eshin. Um, is is there any other information you can tell us about the Monkey King? And that, like, where does he initially come from? Um, uh, is he the one that taught Clan Eshin all of their little secrets that they took back with them to the West? Anything like that? 
I don't know about no. I I think Clash have been more inspired by by the um the, the humans around them. To be honest, mm. um, I mean, I don't know whether there's an established connection with Clan Ashen other than obviously what we've just talked about about so there's certainly hinted at maybe there's an ongoing relationship uh so the monkey king he he basically lives in the south um in the in the mountains of heaven which is a big area which is like um i suppose like it would be like the equivalent of the pyrenees um this mountain chain but you know it's Warhammer, so everything's bigger. Right, that, right. that kind of separates kind of um, Ind from Cafe, so it's a massive area, um, which is technically part in Cafe and technically part in Ind. But that is where where the Monkey King resides, mm. um, and and the Monkey Warriors as well. Um, and and there's a great many Monkey Warriors. They're probably the the second most populous creature. Uh, other than humans in Cafe, mm. and uh, oh. they have been known to fight in the armies of Cafe, much like other, you know, whether whether it's warrior monks or other um, kind of tribes and peoples, because Cafe is so vast. Um, and all this, obviously, we can't get to in in the first first go. Um, <laughs> yeah, the other names. Um, does he have a name? Or is he just the um, Monkey King? He's just the Monkey King at the moment. Mm. At the moment. Okay. <laughs> um, but, yeah, he, he's there. He's, you know, he's not very popular with the, with the dragons uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and, again, sometimes this, these things slip out. And Li, Li Dao, who is the fire dragon, rule of the southern provinces... And the mountains of heaven. So technically, he rules the mountains of heaven, where the oh. monkey king is. Oh. Uh, he's master of the burning winds and lord of the phoenix. Um, so the monkey king is a constant thorn in the side of the fire dragon, and the two are often at odds. This amuses the monkey king, especially as the fire dragon must often call upon his monkey warriors to defend the southern provinces of the empire from Ind and the Nagas of Koresh. So. Oh. He said the thing. He said the thing. He said the thing. <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say about that thing. Uh, <laughs> just that you said it. That's going to yeah power, power power me through many days. A lot uh, of people when they see this video are going to go wild. <laughs> um, so so it sounds like it sounds like the Monkey King is not like he's not necessarily by any means evil. He sounds like he's more of an annoying trickster that's very arrogant. If anything. Which would fall into a historical archetype. Um, I think he's a bit more malign than that. However, clearly the dragons haven't got to the point where they've just gone in and just, you know, purged the area. It, which, which suggests to me that they almost caught up with him for, for reasons that it was probably border security. It's pro probably the lesser of two evils. Having the Monkey King in the Mountains of Heaven means means that it's probably safer than purging that area and then having uh, Ind or Koresh just trawls through. So, what if, and I, I mean this purely from a lore perspective, um, not like fishing for anything. Would, would it be kind of safe to say that he almost kind of has a relationship with Cathay, kind of like Archon the Black does with the Tomb Kings? Or like... They don't really like each other by any means, but they kind of tolerate the existence of one another. I mean, um, yeah, I think that's fair to say. Ooh, awesome. I like that, yeah. At the moment. At the okay. moment. <laughs> well, it is, I, it is, literally, a lot of this stuff is in the book. I, I'm, sure, I'm sure strange alliances and relationships could be happening since the world's catching on fire. <laughs> Absolutely. Nathan, you got anything? Yeah. Um, so uh, just a minor question. Um, obviously, we know that uh, Cafe has had some issues with uh, like Koresh and, and Ind and so on. Is it safe to say they've also had issues with any uh, possible nations to further east? Um, I, I, yeah. 
yes, they they have, and um, that's where the the Jade Sea is, and the Grand Dragon fleets are of the. Um, did I say the Sea Dragon? I forgot. Oh. See, it always pops in and pops out my head. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, um, but that yeah, the Sea Dragon, of course, the Sea Dragon. Um, yeah, and that's kind of what she's she's there for and uh, she pens that eastern coast uh, and and almost proactively goes out to sea with these dragon fleets um to to sink pirates definitely they've had issues with dark elves Mm -hmm. along there uh and there's other human nations um i'm not going to name uh (laughs) that they've had issues with um but on the the flip side, it's also uh, where Fu Chao is, and and Fu Chao is like the eastern version of Shangyang. It, it's a it's a massive cosmopolitan city, um, mm. full of different ghettos of different race, races. And that actually may even be the most cosmopolitan city in the world. That actually leads in really nicely, or segues into our next question. Um, so we we've gotten a little bit on a couple of cities like we know nangao we're learning more about it the city of smoke we're all like the super it's, it's kind of almost sounds like the Nuln of cathay it's where all the war machines are made and you have all these master artificers that live there and stuff um Absolutely. so are there any other cities that are like really important and if if there are could you tell us like if they have any like fancy titles like how nangao is the city of smoke are they the city of x and what what they provide for Cathay? What makes them so special? Are there any highlights? Yeah, yeah, th- there is loads of highlights actually. So um, uh, again, this Fu Chao we, we we just mentioned is in the east. That that's, that's was the palace of 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 the Sea Dragon it is there, and it is extremely cosmopolitan city. Is it a port? Uh, it's a port. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. Um and yeah, there's, there's uh so there's the city of Bay Chai, which again is in the east, uh, and that's a, 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 a got a really dark reputation. That's um a place where where the cults of Chianchi uh, are constantly kind of sprouting up, and no matter how many times they kind of you know, strike strike it down or burn the leaves. The root seems to remain. What was its name? Uh, pardon? What was its name? The Finch City. Uh, Bai Chai. Ah, cool. So that's, that's that's old lore. C H A I. That's old lore. Awesome. There you go. Yeah, yeah there you go. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a magnet for secret worship of the dark gods. Um, so in recent times, the cult of the painted skin has grown in size and strength within the region, mm. believed by the Cafeans to be a splinter cabal of Qian Chi, and um, may well present another of the dark gods at last finding a foothold of the empire. So, um, and that kind of, we'll, we'll go back to all the city stuff, um, but I think that that's a big kind of meta point in that, in that chaos. Uh, um, probably one of the reasons that uh, Cafe has endured for so long is Chaos has always struggled to actually take hold in Cafe. Um, and, and, you know, the three of the gods are just, you know, batting against that great bastion. But there is the notable exception, which is Zench, um, who, you know, have a special name by the Cafeans because, you know, they, they um, have to deal with them. Uh, so much and and the moon empress takes uh, and her agents take a very special interest in in the cults of Chianchi um and she will send her many-eyed cronin out to find them and and it will be, will be the agents um of 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 the empress who, who kind of try and root out the these these cults and to me you know if i was available enough to write black library novels um that be that be what i'll be pitching at the moment i i want to pitch a um a cafe and agent rooting out um chian chi cults in, in in deep in you know in one of these cool cities of cafe i think that would be a great novel 
is, is that they're like is that almost kind of like their their sword masters of Hoeth or their witch hunters of Sigmar? The what were the oh, mi the many eyed crows? Well, no, I didn't say it was them. The many eyed crowmen are of or the J crowmen are oh, no the onx crowmen. Sorry. Of of uh, of the Empress. Oh, those sound scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they are, they are, and they look so. Mark Mark Bradford's shown me sketches of them. They look really scary. Um, but they work for the Empress. Mm. Oh, do they? <laughs> <laughs> they do. They do. They work for the Empress, and you know, uh, and you can imagine going around cafe and you see this murder of, as in collective noun of. Of Croman flying across, and you'd be like, "Well, they're off somewhere." Ooh, <laughs> That's really interesting. Uh, could you tell us anything about the celestial city that is apparently floating above Weijin? If I understood it correctly. Yeah. So the celestial city is home to the celestial court, uh, which is above above Weijin, kind of floats there, and that that is where the dragon emperor and empress kind of reside. Um, it's where they um, receive guests, kind of dignitaries, uh, and and obviously the higher echelons uh, of, of of cafean servants and society uh, society will, will will maybe go once in a lifetime kind of thing to see see them and and it's also um, where the Wu Zing compass kind of resides it's kind of etched on the floor of, of the celestial court and it, it kind of moves and that's how the the dragon emperor kind of can direct kind of the elements of magic and it's the element the elements of magic who, who is what caffeines kind of call the winds of magic so they they like like the rest of the, the, the human world uh understand magic comes in kind of eight eight winds or elements um and and they're engraved on the rusing compass um and and he uses that to di direct uh, you know when the magic's in harmony he can direct that magic um uh, maybe toward the bastion to kind of imbue the bastion when it needs to be or even to to the great dragon river which is the river where the the bastion stops is 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 um that's where the river uh continues that border um and and that river is really interesting actually um because that's where some are rumored where one of the missing dragon children lies underneath that river um and to cross that river is to lose your soul because it's also in cafe in law the gateway to to the underworld oh my um so so um kind of enemy forces or you know cast tribesmen like the hung or the kurgan that have tried to cross that river they just you know they they, they go in and never come out again <laughs> oh my god okay see their, their souls leaving their bodies that is cool wow nice that's a very nice natural border to have it is, it is, and effectively they they built the Great Bastion between that and, and effectively the highest parts of the mountains and more to kind of create that that's northern... That's awesome. That is, that is super awesome. So he, he directs this magic to basically, like, empower one of these locations to make it, like, even more formidable than it even normally is? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay, so I this this has got to lead into. Can you tell us anything about what the deal is with the lore of Yin and Yang? Um, yeah, yeah. Like, what what are yeah. they versus like you know the regular battle lores? So, so you there is there is two there is the laws of Yin and Yang, uh, and they are wielded by the the dragon blood of Shu Zhengen. Uh, and the Shujengen are the are, are are said to be or are can't remember it's said to be or are the ancestors of the uh, you know as the dragon children um you know were born uh, they they had you know they took mates of their own but human mates um 
and and created a kind of a race of dragon blooded humans, uh, of which the most powerful are the Shu Jengans, uh, who are offered uh, and obviously as they then had their own ancestors, children and ancestors. So you you almost have the dragons at the top of this echelon, and then the dragon blooded, and even at the top of the dragon blooded, you've got the Shu Jengan lords, who are all pretty much almost all all powerful mages uh, uh, that can wield the law of Ying or the law of Yang. Um, and then obviously they're sanctioned to use that. And then lower down, you, you have um, stuff like the alchemists, uh, obviously, who who aren't sanctioned by, by like the Jade Dragon, as I kind of hinted at uh, in, in yesterday's blog. So there's plenty of magic in Cafe and plenty of magic users too. Hmm. So are the lores of Yin and Yang kind of like equivalent to the lore of high and dark magic? Like, are they like a weird mix of the lores or is it something that the Celestial Dragon Emperor figured out like a really long time ago and he's just been teaching his kids almost kind of like, uh, kind of like how the geomancy is to the Slon or something. So... They're, um, so the law of Yang is 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 celestial kind of high celestial magic, which is is kind of mostly associated with the Dragon Emperor himself, and the law of Yin, it, which kind of has a again it's kind of a darker undertone, a more subtle undertone, um, but not evil. Um, that's that's Kuei Yin's kind of. Um, magical law. Uh, who's the Moon Empress? Mm. So, so okay. they're kind of adopted by the Dragon Emperor and the Empress, the Law of Ying and the Law of Yang. Um, the 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 flagship laws of, of Cafe, definitely. Mm. Um, but even on top of that, you you have kind of um, high magic, and the dragons can use this kind of. High magic, which which is almost like a, a pick and mix of, of, of different laws, um, called Feng Shi. So the dragons themselves are masters of all eight winds of magic and practice Feng Shi sorcery or high magic, as it is known of the high, high elves. Uh, the dragon blood wizards, most so the Shu Jenjin, can practice Feng Shi sorcery as well. Oh wow! Cannot. Okay. And then, yeah, the, the eight winds are then divided in in into yin and yang and but then subdivided into their elements uh on this compass okay interesting wow okay that's super interesting nathan you got one or you want me to go again yeah i've got a question because we've, we've spoken about loads of different enemies and different things uh moving around there um in the older law specifically uh <clears throat> around fourth or fifth edition suggested a ancient vampiric bloodline which fled to the lands of Cafe. Does that... Uh, is there a cabal of undead hiding around there? <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it was... Let me just find the entry. Uh, Harakat flees from Nefarata and Nagash to Cafe, creating the first blood, the first Jade Blood vampires. So the uh, sweet. sweet Jade Bloodline confirmed. Jade Bloodline is about. Um, that's all I'm going to say on that matter for now. Ah, that's all, all we need at, the, at this point. Honestly, it's just really nice to see all the lore still making it into canon. That that is awesome. What we haven't done quite yet, we we kind of picked and pocketed about the the geography of Grand Cafe, and we mm. picked out a couple of cities. But I think it, it's worth just having a look at the regions. Mm. Um, so, so you obviously have the northern provinces, which we kind of mentioned and covered. That's where the Grand Bastion is. It's also home of Weijing, the city. Um, and then you have Imperial Cafe. Which is kind of the part just south of Waging. Um, and that's a 
effectively ruled by the dragon emperor and dragon empress it kind of comes under them it, it's a bit like how the, in buckingham palace in london the, the the immediate area around it like i can't remember if it's the city of westminster itself is it, it, kind of sovereign territory um but then you have central cafe which is like the the breadbasket of the empire and it it's it's where kind of the, the heartlands it, it, it's reasonably safe if if you wanted to live in the warhammer world uh central cafe may be one of the areas you'd want to live to maximize your lifespan but even statement nice <laughs> and, you know central cafe is lovely this time of year i right hear <laughs> yes. yeah but yeah though even here danger lurks lurks in forests and wilderness regions you know even in the safest place of the warhammer world you know mm. don't go into a wood <laughs> but you'll you'll probably get eaten um it's also home of the city of shangru uh it's a major city in the great river it lies at the end of the broken road where it meets with the great road take a trade so it's a big trade area as well so lots of farming like say bread basket uh, and it's also a conflict where a lot of the great rivers of cafe meet as well and the rivers of cafe are quite important um they're effectively the the highways the super you know the super motorways of, of grand cafe and allow allow them to to kind of move move trade and goods and people you know, not unlike the Empire. Yeah, very similar to the Empire, yeah. Right, and you'll find that in a lot of lot of the more, you know, forward-thinking um, human nations. Bretonia mm-hmm. less so, but we all know. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but the lady! So, yeah. <laughs> one of backwards yokels and uh, superior knights. Um, so, and then obviously to the east, Eastern Cafe, uh, it's actually the wealthiest region in the empire um, because numerous grand cities dot its coastline, as well as famous trading ports like Fu Chao, where we mentioned earlier, that houses a st- substantial population of high elves uh, and peoples from all across the world. And it's also kind of the home of the dragon fleets um, that guard against dark elf raiders the unnamed regions western cafe we've talked about um obviously uh shangyang uh home of shangyang and and ruled over by by the uh, the iron dragon um the tower of ashir there as well and the warpstone desert you know um almost this horrible wasteland where you know caravans have to use these big mirrored shields to make sure effectively the Warhammer radiation doesn't doesn't get to them. Um, <laughs> so it's interesting actually because uh, Shangyang is obviously the, the the spice road or the ivory road leads to Shangyang. So that first impression of cafe to, to foreigners probably isn't a great one because you you're going through leagues upon leagues of this irradiated wilderness. Mm. Uh, maybe seeing the occasional scaven pop there tail up um and uh yeah i think i think we oh yeah and of course south cafe as well which again we kind of already talked on it's like um uh it's people of the forest and wardens uh and um you know this it, it's kind of like lots of foothills that lead pretty much into the mountains of heaven um where Obviously, um, there are lots of tribes of of of, of, of monkey warriors, um, some humans, the occasional Tiger Man village, and the Monkey King himself. Kind of. So, Did you say no, Tiger Man? <laughs> Did, I? Did I say that? I don't know. Hmm. Um. So, uh, one thing I actually wanted to ask about, uh, since we. we kind of mentioned in Skaven a couple times here. So there's there's a lot of lore about how Clan Eshin went to Cathay and learned a lot of their secrets and trades and stuff. Is there any new lore about what happened there? Like, does Clan, do we know where Clan Eshin's big base is in Cathay? Or do we know who taught them? Like, did they make an ally that actually taught them everything? Or did they just kind of sneak around the shadows and figure everything out by watching? Um... 
I don't, I, I think that's kind of not really talked about, not mentioned yet. It's, it's not something we have kind of focused on with, with Games Workshop. Um, we know Planeshin are in the are in the Warpstone Desert. We mm. don't know exactly where they're. I would imagine there's a big Clanation nest somewhere in there. Um, and I don't think we've really covered um, yet. Again, never say never. We haven't really covered how Clanation kind of came to be. Maybe an area that Black Library authors will will, will investigate at some point or, or us and set, us ourselves at a later date. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool, cool. Nathan, you got something? Uh, just checking through here, because most of our stuff has actually been answered already. While you're doing that, I'll throw out another one. Uh, so in one of the articles, uh, the one about uh, Miao Ying, um, we got a mention uh, from Games Workshop's article about how there's a there's a man who invented the Hongming Sky Hulk named uh, Shi Hong, and he's like the master artificer of Nan Gao. Is he just mm. kind of a random, like, random guy, or is he like an important character that we should expect to hear more about and see more? Like, is he like the big master artificer, or is he just one of many? I think he's the master artificer of Nangao. Um, so, so he's he's important, um, and, and whether that will be further kind of. Uh, you know, developed. Um, I, I don't know, but a lot of these Warhammer characters start off exactly like that. You know, mm. just names and timelines, or or you know, names in, in, in a color color piece of color text that mm-hmm. you know, two or three mm. iterations down the road, they're a major special character. Um, and it, it's it's kind of. It's called Dora Jar Games Design or Dora Jar World Building. It, it, it's it's philosophy I, I kind of learnt at Games Workshop, uh, kind of really piled on by, um, um, championed by uh, like Jervis Johnson and, and Rick and, and Tunis Purin, um, some of my contemporaries who, who I used to work with and under. Uh, you know, in that you leave the door slightly ajar on on these little details. You just throw a name out, and all of a sudden, it starts to take a life of its life of its own. And it may just be one of those little tidbits that forever stays a tidbit. But there may be some kind of weird gravitational pull towards it, and and all of a sudden, Shang Hu or Shang Yong, I forgot his name starts to take a life of his own and at some point he may be a major character awesome um, awesome awesome interesting very interesting so he's he is an actual person of note might be something big later might just be like something to hear about but very cool very yeah cool. has he got has he got a entry in in this army book here no huh? not yet certainly can you tell us who does have entries <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh damn. <laughs> I tried. I tried. Nathan, you got something? How how much of Cafe's law by this point would you say is established? Like I'm talking about like uh if we go like going around the timeline of the Empire or Bretonia, how far back will we learn about? Um well, I mean, the timeline literally starts at uh, five nine hundred minus five nine hundred. Mm. So, you know, the writers at Games Workshop and um, and Mark Bedford and Andy Hall and Owen have done a really great job of fleshing it out. You know, mm. um, it, it 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 is there. It is there. It's like I said at the start. We wanted um, kind of a a fully fleshed out eighth edition faction, and and that's what the guys gave us. And we've been able to take that and 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 put it in. Now, is every tit bit here kind of in the game? Probably not. Yeah, that was expected uh, anyway. Because you know we don't just regurgitate the text uh, into a computer game form. Um, I, I 
you know, have always tried to put as much of that law in the game and be reasonably successful. Um, whether it's, you know, the unit descriptions, the quotes. Um, and, you know, we've had a whale of the time. It's been one of my favourite parts of why I'm free to write is all the different quotes for all these kind of brand new races. And, uh, and you know, that's where you establish some of these these relationships. It's like, what does what does Cafe think about the Empire? For so we can mm. write a quote about that. So that's not necessarily in here. Yeah, that we can. I I can extrapolate out. That's kind of where my experience comes in. Mm. Um, you know, obviously also the, the the diplomacy strings are always a great way of adding that kind of flavour. Everybody loves those voice lines. <laughs> yeah. Well, they do, <laughs> but then you hear it for the thirtieth time in a row, and it <laughs> it can get even angrier. <laughs> really. God, Master Monday's talking again. <laughs> um. One thing I wanted to ask that's it's it's about Cathay, but it's a little bit more about kind of the things happening around them. So we've kind of established that Cathay has some notable enemies. Um, I'm sure they've got beastman problems, they got Skaven problems, they got Dark Elf problems, they got warrior problems, demon problems. Um, but do they have any like particularly famous enemies that have caused them like a lot of grief? Like we know there are a good number of ever chosens who have just never been covered, for instance. Do we have any information on any big bads that have threatened Cathay from the other races, such as a particular demon, or do we have a new any new ever chosen from the past that are mentioned and stuff like that? Um, they, I mean, from as far as back as um, minus eight seven, they've had a constant problem with the dark elves raiding and taking slaves. You know, and yeah, dark elves obviously a slayed. A slave uh taking race so why not go you know just that way <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and take from you know a, a very bountiful fruit which is which is cafe hmm. um so i i i, I would i think uh the certainly the dark elves have, have been a problem um obviously chaos from from the north and and insidiously through Chianchi, Chi. uh and uh, uh, you know the ogres too uh, another neighbor that they've been kind of at war with at times to the point that you know they the celestial court um brought down used the astromancers to bring down the comet that created the great moor um so yeah so so they're been a constant form in the side. Whether they will be for for one or three, I don't know. It's actually, a kind of a follow up question: did, Was the Great Maw intentional? Like, obviously, they wanted to pull down a meteor, but did they realize that? Oh, it's a giant warp stone meteor, and it's going to turn into a, like this horrifying, odd thing. Was that on purpose, or was that an accident? <laughs> <laughs> I. I, I don't want to say because I, I I think either way has credible. It, it's not definitive, um, but you know the the the, um, the dragon emperor and and especially the dragon empress are, are, are gifted with a certain amount of foresight. You know, again they, we don't know why they left uh, in the time of darkness and disharmony, um, but it must have been for some reason. So so they they must have a gift of kind of a, a foresight um whether they uh, they intended to really hurt the ogres which they did whether they intended for it to turn into a semi-sentient god mouth i i don't know my gut would be <laughs> probably be not hmm. uh, but who knows who knows it's certainly that that's just my personal view by the way yeah. it's certainly not definitive i've, I've heard of Action. I've heard a good fan theory in my community that's made me uh, laugh a lot. That he, they called down a meteor, but Zinch pulled a fast one on him and made it made sure it was a <laughs> it was a particularly nasty one. I I think that's a totally yeah that's a totally justifiable theory. Yeah, that would certainly play into Zinch's hands, definitely. Um, well, one thing, uh, we, we kind of mentioned them earlier, they, they were briefly brought up, but, uh, one of the 
uh, when you're looking, if you're looking at like a global map of Cathay, one of the only spots that used to show up very consistently in the lore was the Monastery of the Celestial Dragon Monks. Is there any information about, do they still exist? I, I think they may have been mentioned earlier, but do they still exist? Are they, uh, do they have any kind of like interesting characters or like a grandmaster or something of note that we can hear about? Um, there are certainly fighting monks uh in in cafe um whether you'll see them in this iteration uh i, I don't want to say uh fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> but um yeah the, that archetype kind of an eastern benevolent kind of martial monk that we see in, in reality and various myths um certainly something that warhammer plays into or will play into so yeah um uh, yes is, is is the answer whether they're named exactly that um uh or whether that we've tweaked the name uh yeah it, it, awesome. that's probably awesome very probably exciting well, i'm glad um, to hear we still have uh martial artists having at least a prominent Bot somewhere. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Because everyone, everyone wants to see their <laughs> their favorite kung fu movie and uh, yeah, <laughs> or yeah. absolutely. So a lot of all the lore and it looks like the current stuff, obviously from what we've seen from the reveal of the trailer and so on, puts uh, Zinch as obviously one of the big bads uh, for Cafe constantly. Is there a motive? Because obviously through eight editions that we've had, and obviously now going into Total War Warhammer 3 where the trailer was Cafe versus Zinch, it seems that the change of ways is obviously looking at something there. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a big area full of souls, isn't it? Um, for the same reason, you know, that they like the yummy empire souls and, and Bretonian souls of the, the old world. Um, I don't think like there's there's something you know underneath cafe or I think it's the there's mm. just you know it's the most populous place on the planet. Mm. Um, so of course the chaos gods are going to be drawn to that. It's just that this nation is stewarded by dragons, powerful dragons that look upon the gods with disdain. So mm. you know it, it's it's like. It's like having that sweetie cupboard when you were young <laughs> that the parents wouldn't let you in. So, so of course, <laughs> they, everyone's drawn to that. Yeah, it's uh, obviously because if we look at it like uh, elves and Sunesh, Sunesh wants elven souls. It's like his main chow down. Yeah. Uh, it's just because obviously because of such a high population, I'd put like, say, for example, uh, personally, ner like uh, Nurgle or Corn because war, populace, you could corrupt that. But this then leaves me as to another question due to the fact that Zinch is there are the Cathayan dragons corruptible well certainly not these five as of yet I mean there is a question mark over Zaymi um it's like oh, got his name <laughs> oh, the iron dragon that was that <laughs> <laughs> Dragon bro, dragon bro. Dragon bro, yeah. No, I'm not going to start calling that. You guys call him that. Um, uh, the <laughs> Iron Dragon. That's not his official terminology? No. I don't, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Even if I say it, it legitimizes it. Um, no. Um, but I, I'm not going to rule it out. Now, like Mark Bedford, but here he probably would. Um, but there are four missing dragons. Why are they missing? Yeah, I mean, we've seen okay. Zinch do very wondrous things. Like, you got, you got Golrach. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it would be incredibly hard to do. Yeah, and none of the dragons we've talked about here today, certainly the two in Warhammer coming, aren't going to be corrupted anytime soon. I think that's very safe to say. Can you confirm or deny if that gem in Sao Ming's forehead is Jade or Warpstone? <laughs> Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> or, or is Jade Warpstone? 
in the Warhammer world. Oh man, that would be a horrifying reveal. <laughs> Don't do this to me. <laughs> <laughs> that would open up so many worms. One thing we've kind of seen is how Miao Ying it is lightning. Like she's a dragon all about lightning. Lots and lots of lasers going everywhere. Uh, Zhao Ming seems to breathe fire as kind of his uh, main thing. Do the other yeah. two, do the other two dragons have like a thematic element to them as well? Or the other three, three, the other three dragons. Um, yeah, well, I mean, um, there's, I think the clues are often in the names. You've got the sea dragon, the fire dragon, and the jade dragon. So, so they, as and when they, or if you know they appear, um, those thematic elements will be developed and, and brought through. I'm not, I'm not going to just say, oh, it's this and this and this, because obviously, you know, we have artists and concept artists and games workshop who, who <laughs> yeah far better than i can uh, at this exact moment hmm, uh, so they're there and and what they're called i i think you know obviously sets the mind racing about those possibilities uh one question i've kind of had um buzzing around my community that i wanted to ask before i forget is so when when it comes to Cathay, there was there was a bit of a mumbling surprise when it was revealed that the Celestial Dragon Emperor and the Moon Empress and all their kids are like super old. Like they're up there with like the Emperor class dragons, which probably should be a surprise since it's the Celestial Dragon Emperor. But um is there any particular like reasoning behind like y'all's the authors and the people that were working on it where y'all wanted to have them be that level of old? as opposed to something that came after the Great Cataclysm? Like, what, what made y'all look at them and go, okay, we gotta have, these guys gotta be old, like, super old. Um, I, I think that came from, it's, it's just a really interesting take. Because, um, you know, we there was those lore tip bits, I think most famously in the 6th edition army book, that kind of, yeah, six you know, and seven. The, 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 yeah, that that there was a dragon emperor to the east, and, and you know he may even turn into a dragon, um, and and you know I think even there they hinted that he's it's just been a different person, or some even suggest it's been the same man all along. Just uh, I, I, and so I, I thought I think where the, the guys went with that is, is just really in, intriguing and then linking it back to the fact that we know for well many editions now since uh, maybe even third or fourth that the dragons existed before before the old ones so mm -hmm. so why not kind of start linking that up a bit um and therefore they have to be old because of that because we want to kind of link that primordial dragon archetype with the eastern dragon archetype. Um, it also gives Cafe, again, a kind of a unique unique take. You know, they're, they're not governed or, or ruled by some kind of human superhero character like, like Carl Franz is. Um, or even, you know, uh, the Bretonian king. So... I, I, I think it's a, a really cool take. You know, you've got these humans that aren't ruled by humans, and then you start asking the questions: Are, are they? Do they want to be ruled by these dragons? Or is it benevolent? It is benevolent, but um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, are they under that yoke kind of thing, or do, what do the other races feel about that kind of thing? Do they feel the caffeines are under a yoke, or? Do they think they they're lucky to be stewarded by dragons that look after them and um, you know protect them from from chaos and the nasties in the world? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or have they even you know stuttered the caffeine's potential? Who knows? Oh, that actually reminds me of a question that I really wanted to ask because it's bugging me. Can you uh, tell us? A, when the Great Bastion was built, and B, how it was built. Like, did the Celestial Dragon Emperor just go out there and just raise it with a ton of magic? Or was it, like, actually built by humans 
with magical assistance. Because it seems almost implied that he just kind of like pulled a Mazda Mundi and just ripped that out of the ground. Uh, it was built around minus eighteen hundred. Interesting. Okay. Um, so about two thousand years before the emperor, the empire, before Sigma, and and again, it's kind of told in a very mythic way. Um, and again, this kind of gives you a hint that how old the dragon children are, you know, that the fire dragon, that every brick was was kind of fashioned or forged by Zay Ming, the iron dragon, breathed upon by the fire dragon um, and and blessed by by the emperor. And uh, it, so. In the reality of the Warhammer world, uh, yeah, they probably used thousands uh, of their people to build this wall. Um, but obviously, the way it's kind of reiterated in a very mythic fashion within the army book and stuff is like the dragons built it, you know, the dragon children blessed the bricks, etc. Um, but what is kind of indisputable is is that it's almost an extension of uh, of the celestial dragon emperor himself. Um, and should should the bastion fall, uh, that would probably mark the the end of the celestial dragon emperor. Um, the two Ooh. are linked. Interesting. In, yeah, that that is kind of definite. Do they thing. do they still have the lore note about when the Slon caused the big earthquakes that sent the dwarf empire? I, I don't know if it's still on the timeline for Cathay. Uh, it's mentioned in one of the timelines in seventh edition. They mentioned that when the Slon messed with everything and it caused the Skaven to blow up their big machine and the Dwarf Empire fell, that it, there were actually holes ripped in the Great Bastion. Did that still occur? Is so, there, yeah. Was that like a particularly nasty incident? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the overflow of that was like lots of chaos invaded and it took them a good few years. And they invaded deep into Cafe. Um, and that took them a good few years to to kind of cleanse and and rebuild. So so that great cataclysm, not the great cataclysm. Um, but yeah, I remember that incident from you know when I was at secondary school reading about it in the first Skaven Army book, <laughs> and in in the Dwarf book as well. And the fact that it was all linked. And yeah, that 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 kind of narrative through line awesome. is certainly awesome. Reach this iteration, and no one ever knew. Uh, I mean, note as well that the Great Bastion does get breached. It, it does get breached. It's relatively rare, um, but it does happen. Um, you know, and and it, it, it it's always Cafe's never been conquered fully. Um, but the Great Bastion has been breached before, and awesome. you know. So, it's possible in total. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I, I honestly felt like, based on the trailer, that uh, Kairos has probably thrown his weight against <laughs> Cathay quite a few times. Yeah, sure. Kairos or many other, many other great demons. You know, the tales of you know blood first is flashing against it. Ah, yes, um, the, the most efficient method. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, and. It, it's also, you know, a great deal of Terracotta Sentinels are part of built into the Great Bastion as well. Can they activate, or are they just kind of there for a show? Oh, they do activate, yeah. yeah. Oh, ah, I love that. Nice. That's spicy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. the, the Great Bast uh, the, the Terracotta Sentinels, they're not just in the Great Bastion, they're all over Cafe. They're kind of all, you know, you'll, you'll see them um, almost like you know, in a river submerged up to their necks, just dormant, and they have been for hundreds of years, or standing over paddy fields, or, you know, in town centres, just there, and the vast majority of people have just known of this statue, just there. And yet, when Cafe is under threat, the fire will light within it, and it will move. And people go, oh, <laughs> uh, And it will march the wall to protect Cafe. Very magical security system. Yeah, yeah. I cannot I cannot wait to have showdowns between Tomb King constructs and Cathayan constructs. Like That's just see like out. just see a necrotect out there yelling at <laughs> some Cathayan artificer. <laughs> <laughs> um 
uh, one of the things um, I was curious, and I suspect we can't get an answer to this one, but I'll go ahead and ask just in case we can. We know that a lot of the, the big guys in Cathay are these mythical entities. They're, they're dragons or the Monkey King, uh, who seems like he's a powerhouse in his own right, uh, especially if he's based on his mythological, in our world, figure. Uh, but are there any legendary or notable humans within Cathay? Like, are there any great generals or powerful wizards or crazy warriors of some weird system who are noted? Uh, like, who are considered uh, extremely important individuals in their own right? Or is Cathay mostly led by kind of mythical creatures? Um, there, There are many kind of there are many human heroes. Um, uh, the one that springs to mind is 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 like the the, the guy we've already mentioned in Nanjiao. Uh, Shi Hong, yeah. Shi Hong. Um, but the, 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 there are many um many other heroes. I mean, and you know there are you know not every army in cafe is led by a dragon. You know that's. I mean, we focus on the dragons because right. they're new and cool. But there's only five of them. Use it like space marines skew the 40k universe when there's actually there's only a million space marines in the billions of, of things. So seeing a space marine is actually super, super rare. Um, so, but the vast majority of Cafe's legions and armies are, are led by great human, great generals, human generals, uh, even if they're dragon blooded generals or, or you know uh, magistrates uh, and um, human armies um, stuttering a bit here um, I, have I got some names that I can just throw out at you at the moment Pro- probably not yeah that's, um, right. that's right but but yeah those heroes are there those great generals uh, they're just you know we haven't brought them to the fall yet, but there's plenty of time. I'm hoping. I'm hoping for a kung fu master. <laughs> that's, that's that's my hope right now. Um, oh, the second game. Yeah. Uh, um, and I, I think the um the other question that I have on my mind at the gosh darn it, I just lost it. Nathan asked a question. I just lost what I was going to ask. Put me on the spot like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's your turn. Do something. Um. Well, honestly, you, you've been answering pretty much everything that's been on our original list when it comes to these types of things. So, I know, he's destroying us. <laughs> he's yeah. destroying us. Like, at the beginning, oh, he knocked out... Mess, so I hope you can <laughs> concoct something out of it. Um. Um, actually, I've, I've, I've got another question. Uh, so... We know there are astromancers, which seem to be vaguely Lord Heaven's guys, and we know there are alchemists, which seem to be the lore of metal. Are there any other notable wizard types that are known to show up in Cathay? And on top of that, as a second, a part two, could you explain why astromancy is considered okay by the Jade Dragon, but alchemy isn't? Uh, yeah. Um, so. Okay, um, so you have the Shujengen, which are the obviously the higher echelon of dragon-blooded right. wizards who practice laws of yin and yang. Um, um, and then you have the Astromancers, which obviously the Celestial Dragon Empire Emperor um, sanctions. You know they're sanctioned. You know, um, and and you know. Other wizards and magic users are for probably the same reasons that the um, that the emperor empire's witch hunters are are not sanctioned. You know that's an easy way for Qian Chi to to kind of gain purchase within cafe. I see that makes sense. Now oh, yeah. the alchemists aren't sanctioned by the Dra- Jade Dragon, and he's the guy that issues the edicts and statutes of cafe. He's the guy that manages this great wheel of bureaucracy. Now, the Iron Dragon, as we know, is a bit of a, you know, bit of a rules. He didn't give a. He, 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 yeah, he likes to give the double, <laughs> the, 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 the double fingers. Yeah. You know, he's, 
you know, you're issuing an edict. You're looking at, it, you know, so so he's he's created this conclave called the um, the House of Secrets, which is um, where these kind of cabals uh, of of kind of fire alchemists and metal alchemists um, kind of gather, and and these are the guys that. You know, having this lust for knowledge and and know that in in within the warpstone desert is is it's like I think I mentioned like uh, in the in, in the blog, you know, they'll go on these expeditions. Um, you know, probably all suited up, etc. <laughs> gotta got, uh, gotta make that philosopher's stone <laughs> or yeah, whatever it is they're chasing. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> um, so they don't get contaminated by the desert because it really is it really is a horrible wasteland out there. Um, and and they'll bring back these elements and stuff. Uh, those that you know don't get picked off by war ba- rival war bands or clanation. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, and and, and so the Iron Dragons fostered that kind of um, you know acceptable behaviour, and, and so that's why it drags the these kind of unsanctioned wizards to him. Um and you know if he wasn't a dragon he wouldn't have got away with it but because he is a dragon and probably because the moon empress kind of looks over I was about to him. ask yeah, yeah he's, the, he's, the he's mommy's favorite sequence. he's a mommy's the house boy. of secrets obviously harkens back to what you said earlier about the moon empress so she she is fully aware <laughs> are the rest of them completely aware of like say for example all his doings I mean maybe you know i have a brother that lives in uh, lives near scotland am i vaguely aware of what he gets up to on a daily basis no do Mm. i generally know what he's up to (laughs) Mm. zalbing almost seems like the kind of guy that when he gets together with siblings he like deliberately brings up stuff that he's not supposed to be doing just to (laughs) to piss everybody off he totally would totally would just to you know just Especially Jay, I, 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 like I know it says that him and um, Miao Ying uh, are very polar opposites and don't get along. But I imagine Zhao Ming gets way too much pleasure out of torturing the Jade, <laughs> the Jade Dragon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, um, just to contextualize, you know, don't not getting on doesn't mean they're always at each other's throats and they will unite, as because uh, I kind of mentioned earlier for for the. For the benefit of Grand Cafe and, and stuff, so mm. you see them together and wonder why they're not ripping each other's eyes out. It's because, well, just like you, you know, real family. You know, when you get together, you're not instantly going to fight, but you you may share a meal or something, or talk to each other, mm. even if you're there to just yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so something that you mentioned earlier that I actually just thought to ask about real quick is we, we kind of mentioned that there is a form of religion in Cathay, which is the ancestor worship. Um, does that have any sort, are there any kind of like priests or is there like a formal cult that oversees that? Or is it more of just kind of a personal thing and there's no, there's no overseers of that, uh, experience? Yeah, I think it's very much the latter. Okay. So there's no like ancestor. warrior priests or any of that kind of stuff. No, no, mm. no. There's no kind of grand temple of ancestor worship in way you're reading and stuff. Like mm. I say, worship of gods is is not something that's encouraged in cafe. Mm. Um, the dragons are revered by dint of protecting the humans and have been, and that's all they've been known. You know, mm. like. Oh, I- um, I think they've got the right of it. Warhammer guides are a mess. <laughs> they, yeah. they are a they're a motley crew. Awesome. This is all yeah. uh, just super exciting and really fun information to get. Uh, I think oh. I think honestly, I'm kind of I'm kind of out of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Same. I think I think that's probably a good place to kind of wipe you up if people are still watching. God bless you. Oh, I'm well, I'm sure you. they are. Um, <laughs> And yeah, I think I think that well is 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 getting dry. So, um, but you know, even then, I'm only touching the surface of what of, of, of what's 
what's there and you know we've still got so much to show you i guys. got one last serious question about warhammer fantasy on, Lord, okay this is this is this is really important to me okay fish people are they real <laughs> are they real well there's been rumors of needle needle fanged monstrosities jumping aboard ships deep in the great ocean All right you heard it here folks confirmed <laughs> Both confirmed. confirmed. <laughs> i'm just saying there's been rumors and myths about it oh uh, ever since i saw ineth deacon i'm like i it's so close to what i want <laughs> it's so close <laughs> <laughs> well andy thank you so much for coming on uh the podcast to chat with us this has been an absolute privilege uh for both of us uh, and I'm sure oh. for everybody listening, uh, this yeah. this to say this was a okay. treat. There's there's no words for it. <laughs> like, this thanks very much, good. guys. It is good to talk about this stuff because uh, I've been, you know, keeping it secret for so long. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. I don't. <laughs> just to get you know, just vomit law at people, um, fully sanctioned as well. <laughs> <laughs> Good to be able to do that so yeah it's been it's been a pleasure and uh like i say i hope i haven't bored anyone and thank everyone that's still watching this i'm, I'm sure there's three of you hey we're actually doing pretty well in some yeah. countries <laughs> we just got yeah. some really nice stats back <laughs> yeah we're, we, we, we're, we could actually uh, show off a little bit you know? we're number one in austria and uh i forget what the other one is i'm so sorry <laughs> it is i forgot well, you know, I'm sure when it's just you two, it's brilliant. You know, it's it's just when you drag this ugly, absolute ugly mush onto onto your screen. So, so, says know, says, the most, some, says the most attractive says, face <laughs> in the room. <laughs> yeah. You've been able to bring a lot of good knowledge to uh, a lot of people because I I know a lot of the viewers uh, who watch myself and Sotek through our normal content too. Uh, a lot of them are old guard; they're Warhammer fantasy fans. So this to them is something they've wanted to know for decades so this is incredible like i have been sat here listening to you with a big smile on my face like th this has been really cool and I, I it can't be understated i just want to make sure i say this to where you can hear it of that i've had the pleasure to talk to so many people from uh like china or southeast asia or that part of the world that are so beyond excited to have like representation of their cultures and stuff appearing in the Warhammer universe. And it's, it's such a blessing that y'all were able to do this or that y'all decided to do this for us and, and bring out like something truly fantastic and resurrect the Warhammer fantasy world in a way that we never thought would be possible. So really, really thank you and all the people you've been working with for no, it, it's been a pleasure, and it, it is really good to hear it. it it's it's gone down well uh, uh, on you know that side of the world. You know, it, we want them to to be happy and and you know, feel that you know just like I do when I play the Empire that that there's something for the, for them, not exclusively for them, because I've been playing Cafe and I bloody love it. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm all Miao Ying first playthrough. <laughs> unless unless they wheel out Kugoth, that's the only person that might challenge that throne. But right now, Miao Ying, all in. <laughs> it's great to great for them to to be on board. Can't can't wait to, you know, after two hours of me talking, um, to actually show show the game in it in its its splendor. Uh, so it's coming, it's coming. So, so don't worry about it. Really excited. Uh, yeah, we don't know exactly when this is going to release, uh, but hopefully when it does, everyone will really, really enjoy this. Um, uh, Nathan, any closing thoughts? No, as, as, well, thank you for uh, being a guest and uh, to all our listeners. I hope you've learned a lot. Uh, you know, especially all the old guard that I know of, that comment on my videos and so on. I really hope that you got the, what you wanted to, to hear because this is incredible. This uh, cafe is drawing ever closer insane mr andy hall any any last thoughts for us as we're heading out um no um i can't wait to show you all of why i'm afraid it's it's the best game i've ever done or we've ever done as well you know there's been so many people working on this game actually and, uh, last little thing 
can we are, can we expect any little like short stories from you like we had with the vampire coast and some of the other things maybe please <laughs> please <laughs> Just a little they can be he's short. smiling <laughs> i've been asked to do something um so watch this space <laughs> oh, all right man. that's gonna be it for us uh before we start asking more questions to get in trouble so yeah. <laughs> we're gonna go ahead and get out of here thank you all so much for watching and we'll see you guys next time thanks bye